What do you do when someone steals all your relatives? Or your eggs? Call your local fairy and fly after them, of course. Released back in the 90s, Spyro was an awesome little dragon that we all love to make run around a bunch of islands and fight evil bosses to save the day. The games weren't only a blast to play, but they were way ahead of their time in terms of technology, and we'll tell you how. Hi, I'm Jacob with the leaderboard, and we're here to tell you all about this kick-ass purple dragon, and also the pesky money bags. So call up your fairy friends and get ready for 107 facts about Spyro. Let's get started. Fact number one. Spyro the Dragon was released in September of 1998. It was published by Sony Computer Entertainment and released for the original PlayStation. Number two. Technically speaking, Spyro was published by Universal Studios and Universal sub-licensed the right to Spyro to Sony, so that may help clear up why Spyro was originally a Sony exclusive and is now available multi-platform. Number three. The original Spyro trilogy was developed by Insomniac Games, the brilliant minds who also created Ratchet & Clank, the Resistance series, and Sunset Overdrive. Number four. Universal Universal Interactive Entertainment Director Mark Cerny challenged Insomniac to make a full 3D platformer game where the enemies interacted with the player. Number 5. At the time, most enemies in games would either follow preset paths, perform single functions, or just be static, but in Spyro they specifically targeted the player whether it was to do damage to them or just to taunt them. Number 6. In Spyro the Dragon, Nasty Nork traps dragons in crystals, except for Spyro who goes across the dragon realms in order to save the trapped dragons and defeat Nasty. Number 7. For those who haven't played or don't remember, Nasty Nork goes on a rampage and traps all the dragons after being called ugly. See what bullying leads to? Not even once, kids. Number 8. Spyro the Dragon was developed by just six members of Insomniac Games. The studio was so small that one animator animated every character in the game. Jeez, talk about overtime. Number 9. As of 2016, exactly 20 years later, Insomniac had just shy of 200 employees. Imagine what kind of Spyro game they could make for us now with all that brain power. Unfortunately, imagining is all we can do at this point. <sighs> Wistful sigh. Number 10. Spyro the Dragon has six distinct worlds, one for each member of the dev team, dozens of characters, bonus flying rounds, a secret level, and two different win sequences. Number 11. Spyro was created for two main reasons. The first was that Insomniac wanted a light-hearted break from the hardcore first-person shooter Doom clone genre after they had created Disruptor. Number 12. The second reason was that as consoles became cheaper and more popular, the average age of PlayStation players was decreasing, so they wanted to develop a game with more appeal for a younger audience. Number 13. Although Spyro is forever cherished in the hearts of gamers nowadays, originally Insomniac's founder, Ted Price, was worried that Spyro was going to be released too late, as other 3D platformers like Super Mario 64 had released two years before Spyro. But luckily for gamers, the 3D platformer genre wasn't dead, and still isn't. Number 14. When it came time for Insomniac to get working, there were two ideas on the table. Craig Stitt pitched an idea about a dragon, and Ted Price pitched another about aliens invading Earth. I'll leave it up to you to figure out which idea won. Number 15. If you guessed the one about the dragon, you're right. But if for some reason you guessed the one about aliens invading Earth, you're also right. Ten years after the release of Spyro, Insomniac also released Resistance Fall of Man, a game about aliens invading Earth. Number 16. Stitt wanted to create a dragon game because, and I quote, they are the greatest creature. It's the combination of a Tyrannosaurus Rex and with wings and it breathes fire and they're cool. The man knows what he likes. Number 17. Okay, so Stitt was obviously a huge dragon fan, but Insomniac was on board with a dragon-based game because dragons can run, fly, jump, shoot, fire, all that good stuff, which would open up a lot of gameplay options. Number 18. Originally, Spyro was designed as an adult dragon, but Insomniac changed their mind when they realized a massive, terrifying, grown-up dragon wouldn't exactly resonate with kids. Number 19. So when they started to redesign Spyro, Insomniac wanted a character that would be cute, but at the same time mischievous, bratty, and unpredictable. The perfect mix of gaming's two biggest icons at that time, Mario and Sonic. Number 20. To ensure Spyro would look iconic, Insomniac Games contacted Crash Bandicoot's designer, Charles Zambillis. Zambillis also designed Jack and Daxter, and he also did design work on a bunch of 80s and 90s cartoons like She-Ra, Princess of Power, Wish Kid, Captain N, and the 1993 Sonic the Hedgehog series. Number 21. Speaking of Crash Bandicoot, in Spyro the Dragon, if players held L1 and Triangle on the start menu, they could play a secret demo of Crash Bandicoot Warped. Number 22. In early stages of design, Spyro was 
originally green. Unfortunately, since most of the levels were filled with grass, it didn't really work out and became really difficult to locate Spyro during gameplay. Number 23. The Insomniac art team tried over a dozen different colors for Spyro before they finally settled on his iconic purple. Purple was decided as the color because he stood out from the grass, he was a different color than competitor mascots like Mario, Sonic, or Crash, his details stood out, and most importantly, it was just a fun looking color. Number 24. Bright, vivid color schemes were a theme on Spyro because Insomniac wanted the game to stand out from the realistic muted color palettes that had become ubiquitous in games back then and even endured till today. Number 25. Spyro was originally named Pete, but an unlicensed game about a green dragon named Pete probably wasn't going to sit well with Disney's lawyers thanks to the Disney film Pete's Dragon, so Insomniac decided to change the name. Number 26. However, despite the name change, Insomniac still didn't land on Spyro. Due to some fascination with the letter P, the next name proposed was Pyro, but a game named Pyro the Dragon sounded a little too mature, so it was back to the drawing board. It also sounds like something that would have come from Homestar Runner. The Adventures of Trogdor and Pyro, burninating the low poly textures of the countryside. Number 27. It took the development team months to decide what to name their game, but Sony's director of product marketing, Amy Blair, suggested adding an S in front of the previous name, and thus Spyro was named. The name didn't catch on right away, though, and took members of the team quite a while to get used to it. Luckily for us, they eventually did. Number 28. Linguists have broken down the name Spyro as a combination of the Greek word for fire, pyro, and the Latin word spiro, which means to breathe. Appropriately, our favorite purple dragon breathes fire. Coincidence? No, definitely not. Probably not. Maybe. Number 29. When developing Spyro, Insomniac wanted to create a bright, saturated fantasy world without making it look too cartoony. Seems like they achieved that goal to me. Number 30. The staff designed Spyro to collect gems because it's widely known and accepted that dragons love treasure. Some of them love it a bit too much. Cough, cough, smog the stupendous. Number 31. As a 3D platformer, Spyro the Dragon did its best to break away from the prototypical world environments. You know what I mean, how every game back in the day had a fire world or an ice world. Instead, Spyro opted for major themes. Artisans, peacekeepers, magic crafters, and machinists. Not that there's anything wrong with the world's method. We still love you, Ocarina of Time. Except you, Water Temple. You sit in the corner and think about what you did. Number 32. Each level in Spyro the Dragon was given a feeling and theme, and the production team worked extra careful to not make them too corny. Regardless of the level's theme, each one was given the same amount of detail and ornamentation. On top of that, to make each level different, each world opens with dramatic three-dimensional panoramas. Number 33. However, Insomniac didn't want the levels to feel too different either, so they included special motifs to interconnect the worlds. For example, there's a family of balloonists that travel from world to world, and each of the family members featured in each world would indicate the way out of the level. Number 34. Many of the levels were inspired by movies. The Beast Makers Hub was inspired by Apocalypse Now, Cliff Town was inspired by Star Wars, and a bunch of the levels paid homage to Indiana Jones. Number 35. While movies played a big role in level design, the game opens with a typical TV interview. Why would would a game about dragons open with a TV interview, you might be wondering? Well, the Insomniac team just wanted a unique start to the game, and we'd say they succeeded. Number 36. While the levels and gameplay may look outdated to you kids with your battlefronts and your Call of Duties, at the time, Spyro was a technological marvel. Over 80% of the game was made with handwritten code. Just think about trying to write even one level's worth of code for a game nowadays. Now, send a letter of appreciation to Spyro's programmer, Alex Hastings. Number 37. In Spyro Spyro, players had an unlimited ability to glide, which was unprecedented in games at the time. As long as he started from somewhere high enough, Spyro could glide from one end of the map to the other. Remember people, this was being developed in 1996. Take that, Arkham Asylum. Number 38. Because Spyro could endlessly glide, it made levels significantly harder to design because Spyro's movement was unbounded. For example, think about how difficult Super Mario 64 would have been if Mario could glide. That infamous hallway with the trapdoor couldn't have existed. Number 39. However, Spyro glide was also a blessing for the game because Insomniac could then create secret spots in levels, as long as they also included some sort of high peak. In fact, some gems were tucked away in spots so far away that you'd think Insomniac was just making fun of you, but Insomniac actually did intend for players to glide across the map to find them. Number 40. This led to another major design decision. The sparkle from a gem in Spyro the Dragon can be seen at any distance, so even if the gem is so far away from Spyro that it doesn't even register as a pixel on the screen, there will still be a visible 
visible sparkle over its position. Number 41. To make sure Spyro's glide felt right, Insomniac hired a rocket scientist from NASA, Matt Whiting. I mean, when you think about it, dragons and rockets both fly and shoot fire, so it makes sense. Whiting's training in flight control systems translated beautifully to a video game. Number 42. Whiting also helped create the camera controls for the game, which proved to be nearly as difficult as programming a spaceship. In early playtests, the camera responded so quickly to Spyro's movements that it made players feel seasick. Number 43. Mark Cerny also wanted Insomniac to create a 3D panoramic game environment that extended into the horizon without the use of fog effects to mask far away unloaded objects on the map. The fog effect was a common practice at the time, as it was less taxing for the system to render. Again, this was the late 90s. Tamagotchis were considered groundbreaking technology. It's easy to forget we live in the future. Number 44. In every Spyro level, there were two separate worlds being rendered at once. Each level had a detailed version built of textured polygons and a simple version built of fast rendering untextured polygons. Some worlds were drawn for everything near the player, while others were used for distant objects. Number 45. The level of detail system is pretty much what is used in every game that exists nowadays, but again people, we can't stress how insane this was for a game being developed in 1996. Spyro had really impressive technology for the time. Number 46. Some of the skies in Spyro the Dragon had 5,000 polygons. As a frame of reference, Final Fantasy XV had a max of 100,000 polygons per character, 20,000 of which just for hair. Number 47. For all you nostalgic fans wishing to play Spyro with updated visuals, in 2016, user I Am Murloc recreated the first level of Spyro in Unreal. The level is even available for download so you can play around in it, or you can just look at some videos. Number 48. Spyro came in at number 39 in Guinness World Records Top 50 Video Game Characters of All Time, and this list was made before the massive popularity of Skylanders. Number 49. According to our expert calculations, at the time of Year of the Dragon, Spyro is at least 12 years old. New dragons are introduced to the realm every 12 years, so Spyro must be 12 years old, or he could also be 144 and just look super great. Wonder what his secret is. Number 50. The titular villain of the second Spyro game, Ripto, got his name from the Japanese katakana for Spyro, and after looking at the box art, it's pretty hard to argue against that one. Number 51. Spyro doesn't just share the same character designer as Crash Bandicoot, they also share a voice actor. Carlos Alazraki provided the voice of Spyro in Spyro the Dragon. Number 52. Alazraki also provided the voice of the famous Taco Bell dog, Rocco from Rocco's Modern Life, Mr. Crocker on Fairly Odd Parents, and like a million other roles. Seriously, we promise you've heard this guy's voice before. Number 53. Ironically enough, Alazraki worked alongside Tom Kenny on Rocco's Modern Life, with Kenny providing the voice of Rocco's right hand man, uh, Steer, Heifer. If you're wondering where the irony is, it's because Tom Kenny would later go on to voice Spyro in Ripto's Rage, Year of the Dragon, and Enter the Dragonfly. Number 54. If you don't know who Tom Kenny is at this point, shame on you. Okay, but if you actually don't know him, he's been the voice of your childhood and adulthood for the past 30 plus years. SpongeBob, Dexter's Laboratory, Looney Tunes, Samurai Jack, Adventure Time, Powerpuff Girls, he's done it all. Number 55. Spyro was actually Kenny's first video game role, and he's since appeared in various games such as LEGO Dimensions, Disney Infinity, any Adventure Time game, and any game with SpongeBob. Number 56. Kenny's voice can also be heard in the Skylander series as the voice of Stink Bomb. Moving on up or down? Moving forward. Let, let's go. Let's go with that. Moving forward. Number 57. Keeping the Nickelodeon ties going, Clancy Brown, the voice of Mr. Krabs in SpongeBob SquarePants, provided the voices of many of the dragons in Spyro the Dragon. Number 58. The voice of Spyro changed a couple of times and was later voiced by Jess Harnell, who was also the voice of Wacko Warner, and then by Elijah Wood. And if anyone's familiar with magical creatures, it's that guy. Number 59. The voice of Sparks also changed several times and has been voiced by David Spade, Wayne Brady, and Billy West, who you may recognize as Fry on Futurama, or as literally every voice you've ever heard in your entire life. Number 60. To avoid your standard loading screens, Insomniac Games developers had Spyro travel to lands via portals. The portals allowed the levels to load seamlessly while Spyro traveled, instead of stopping gameplay to let levels load. Number 61. Stuart Copeland, drummer of the rock band The Police, composed the soundtrack for the Spyro trilogy. Copeland would play each level multiple times before buckling down to compose a song for the level. Getting paid to play video games and write music? Keep living the dream, Stuart. Number 62. The song from Spyro the Dragon's Wizard Peak also happened to be the closing tune for Nickelodeon's The Amanda Show, which Copeland also worked on. The Nickelodeon presence is just so strong with this game. Nickelodeon presents Spyro the Dragon. Number 63. The Japanese version of Spyro the Dragon was altered to better suit Japanese audiences. Among the changes, there were more sounds for Spyro, signposts with hints and tips, and a different camera. Also, for some reason, the game was slower. Number 64. The Japanese version also had a woman voice Spyro and added extra dialogue whenever 
Spyro would glide or charge. After all, women are better at multitasking. Number 65. The changes in Spyro the Dragon were also applied to Ripto's Rage and likely would have been applied to Year of the Dragon, but the third game was never released in Japan. Sorry, Japan, we kind of dropped the ball on that one. Number 66. We almost got a Spyro movie based on the trilogy, appropriately named The Legend of Spyro 3D. Get it? Because the movie would have been in 3D, but also would have centered around the three games. It's a clever title. Laugh, please. The movie was set to release around Christmas in 2009. Number 67. The storyline was supposed to be about Spyro thinking he was a dragonfly that was just slightly bigger than Sparks and the other dragonflies, and also more purple. Spyro doesn't figure out his powers until the village is attacked one day, and he begins instinctively fighting back and saving everyone. Number 68. According to the movie's writer, the movie was cancelled after Activision decided to take Spyro in a different direction, and two years after the movie was supposed to premiere, we got Skylanders. Number 69. While we won't be discussing Skylanders much in this video, it's worth mentioning that Spyro's creator himself is a fan of the new direction that his Purple Dragon is headed. There have been six Skylanders games released from 2011 to 2016. Number 70. At the end of some of the credits in Spyro the Dragon, it says, no sheep were harmed during the creation of this game, which is likely a nod to some of the game's commercials that featured sheep protesting the dragon. It was super weird, but it, it, it was the 90s. That whole decade was weird. Number 71. Spyro's personality changed after his first game because many players felt he was too cocky and arrogant, so in the following Spyro games, he was rewritten to be much more likable. Number 72. Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage was released just over a year after the first game in November of 1999. It received an 8.8 .8 rating from IGN, which stated that it was what the first game should have been and keeps players going for hours. Number 73. Ripto's Rage was renamed Gateway to Glimmer in the UK, which is a much friendlier name for the sequel, but somewhat of a misleading title. I mean, Ripto's pretty enraged. Number 74. In Ripto's Rage, Spyro takes a break and is about to go on vacation, but he gets summoned to Avalar instead. Apparently, the evil wizard Ripto has taken over Avalar, and the people need Spyro's help to take back their land. Number 75. With the development of Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage, the team in Insomniac threw out all the rules and decided to just make a crazy game. And needless to say, they succeeded. From blowing up sharks to rescuing the king's babies, there's all kinds of madness happening in Avalar. Number 76. In Spyro the Dragon, gameplay was driven by collectibles, whereas Ripto's Raid was developed with specific tasks in mind, like completing hunter's challenges or keeping baby turtles out of a cauldron, which sounds easy, but they keep booking it towards the cauldron. What is in there that is so important to you? Number 77. Each level had three to four challenges to complete with varying levels of difficulty. Talisman challenges were the straightforward ones for the novice players that were mandatory to complete, and the orb challenges were for hardcore players who needed something more difficult to engage them. Number 78. Ripto's Rage also came bundled with 40 minigames, a gameplay feature that served as the precursor to Year of the Dragon. Number 79. The hardest minigame in Ripto's Rage was the Caveman Challenge, where Spyro had to rescue a caveman from some large, angry lizards. Number 80. Insomniac Games wanted Ripto's Rage to fit within the Spyro universe while still feeling fresh, so they introduced over a hundred new characters to the game. One hundred! It's like they took game design cues from Game Freak. I mean, they didn't, but that's what it feels like. Number 81. Among the new characters was the infamous bear Moneybags. In the game, the bear is a con man who charges Spyro a crap ton of gems to unlock certain areas in the game. Unfortunately for the players, Moneybags has appeared in virtually every other Spyro game since, except Skylanders, thankfully. Number 82. Moneybags was hated so much that players figured out various ways to glitch the game and avoid Moneybags areas entirely. Number 83. Luckily for the players, Insomniac realized just how annoying this bear was and allowed the players to attack Moneybags to get their gems back near the end of Year of the Dragon. Number 84. In Ripto's Rage, Spyro faces a bunch of new enemies, but there are two that particularly stand out. The Gear Grinders and the Gear Grinder Robots. The Gear Grinders are orange wrench-wielding enemies, while the Grinder Robots are small green-eyed robots. Okay, sure, they look fairly different, but come on, there has to be some part of you that thinks that these guys could have been the precursors to Ratchet and Clank. Number 85. Ripto's design is based on Insomniac's director of animation, Oliver Wade. The staff, including Oliver himself, also said that Ripto's personality is most similar to Oliver, including his fiery temper. Number 86. When asked who Spyro is most like on the development team, most employees answered Chuck Suong, who is one of the animators. They said Chuck is very positive and always comes back for more, just like Spyro. Number 87. Ripto's Rage marks the first appearance of Insomniac Games employee Dan Johnson. He later made more video game cameos, including some in Ratchet and Clank. Number 88. In Ripto's Rage, Dan's face can be found on the coins in the fountain in Mystic Marsh, though considering the graphics at the time, we wouldn't be surprised if you missed that one. Dan Johnson 
Johnson also appeared in Year of the Dragon as one of the wanted posters in Dino Mines. Number 89. Spyro Year of the Dragon was released less than a year after its predecessor in October of 2000. The game earned its name because 2000 just so happened to be the Zodiac Year of the Dragon. Funny how these things just seem to work out sometime. Number 90. In Spyro Year of the Dragon, an evil rabbit named Bianca and her army of Rhinox steal dragon eggs for an even more evil sorceress who wants the baby dragon wings for a spell to grant her immortality. And it's up to Spyro and some new friends to save the day. Number 91. Year of the Dragon was the last Spyro game developed by Insomniac Games, which made us all sad. But we understand. Ratchet and Clank was conceived and developed while Insomniac Games was still working on Year of the Dragon. Number 92. Ted Price joked that there was only so much they could do with Spyro, and one of the reasons that they moved on was because Spyro couldn't hold anything, like a gun. Though it may have been a joke, it actually makes sense when you consider the crazy variety of guns they made for the Ratchet and Clank series. Just imagine what could have been if Spyro had hands and opposable thumbs. Number 93. Year of the Dragon took ten and a half months to complete. Ted Price called it the smoothest production cycle Insomniac ever had. I've had school projects last longer than this production cycle. Number 94. Year of the Dragon's minigames were influenced by a ton of other video games, including, better strap in for this list, it's a doozy, Tony Hawk, Doom, Scramble, Gauntlet, GoldenEye, Robotron, Virtua Cop, Mario Kart, Crash Bandicoot, Ready to Rumble, Mario 64, Rampage, and, oh, of course, none other than Spyro 2. Number 95. Year of the Dragon allowed players to not only control Spyro, but it also introduced five new playable characters. Sparks, Spyro's dragonfly companion and health meter, Sheila, a kangaroo with special jumping abilities, Special Agent Penguin Sergeant James Bird, Bentley the Yeti, and pistol-wielding Space Monkey Agent 9. Number 96. The new playable characters in Year of the Dragon were introduced because Insomniac felt it was a more organic way to introduce the new control schemes and moves to the game. To be fair, it would have been a little weird seeing Spyro carry around a massive club like Bentley's. Not that it wouldn't be fun, it would just be weird. Number 97. In the coding of all three Spyro games, there was a poem hidden in the data files that had lines from poems by Charles Dickens and Shakespeare. The last sentence says, and I always get the Shemp. Do you know what that means? Because we have no idea. Number 98. Apparently, the Shemp was important to the developers because they used it to name Dr. Shemp in Spyro 1 and also a skateboarding trick in the Spyro 3 minigame. Number 99. Rumor has it that Shemp might stand for the term fake Shemp, which refers to an actor that has his or her back turned to the camera. After all, Dr. Shemp does have to turn his back to Spyro to attack and defeat him. Makes a little more sense now. A little. Number 100. To keep Year of the Dragon fun for both kids and adults, Insomniac developed a gameplay difficulty curve dubbed the Active Challenge Tuning System, which sensed how well a player was doing and tuned the difficulty to suit the players. Number 101. Year of the Dragon contains a bunch of harsh anti-theft and anti-piracy codes in the game. For example, when triggered, the code removes some of the game's gems and dragon eggs, making the game pretty much unwinnable. And in the European version, the game's language would randomly change. Ha! Finally! Cheaters never win! That statement finally applies to something. Unless they speak multiple languages, please don't take that as a challenge. Number 102. And if you still didn't realize they rigged your pirated game, the save game fairy Zoe would tell Spyro that he is playing a hacked version of the game. Who needs the tooth fairy when you have Zoe the pirate fairy? At least she warns you when your game is all messed up and junk. Number 103. Insomniac was so harsh with the Year of the Dragon because the anti-piracy measures in Ripto's Rage were bypassed after just a week of the game being released. Jeez, people, calm down. Number 104. In 2012, the Spyro Trilogy was re-released for just under $10 on PlayStation 3 and the PS Vita on the PlayStation Network. Number 105. To put that money in perspective, Spyro the Dragon launched with a suggested retail price of $14.99. Adjusted for inflation, that's about 22 bucks in today's money. Ah, oh, the good old days where you could just buy the Spyro Trilogy for a little more than the price of a Skylander starter pack. Number 106. If you're a purist, though, you can head over to Amazon and buy the Collector's Edition 3-disc set for the very low price of $125 used or $500 for a factory-sealed copy. And fact number 107, Trilogy fans fear not. Ted Price and Insomniac are open to revisiting their beloved dragon and creating another Spyro game. They just rebooted Ratchet and Clank in 2016, so we can dream. Once again, I'm Jacob, and thanks for watching 107 Facts About Spyro. Which game in the series is your favorite? What was your favorite challenge? Comment below and let us know. We have new videos dropping every week, so let us know what game you want us to cover next. And if you like getting more from your games, subscribe to the leaderboard, where we help you game smarter.